everyone. Welcome to Wrightsville Assembly of God. I'm Kayla. And I'm Val. And we want to thank you for joining us for church today. It's so great to have you with us today. The service is going to start in just a moment. The worship team is going to lead us in a few songs. The lyrics will be on the screen so you can engage in worship however you feel comfortable. And after that, you are going to hear a powerful message. If you are joining us online, we are thrilled to have you here with us as well. Wherever you're joining us from, thank you so much for making Wrightsville Assembly of God a part of your weekend. If you are in the building with us, we want to let you know that we have a nursery and kids church available today. If you need assistance finding your kids' classroom, any of our volunteers wearing a lanyard would love to help. And if you have kids in the service with you who get fussy or restless, our service is streaming live on the TV in our lobby. With all of that being said, we are going to get started in just a moment. So find your seats if you haven't already, and we will get started shortly.
Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see you this morning. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning? Amen. Amen. Well, why don't you stand to your feet as we just prepare to worship? What a blessing it is to worship the Lord. We're just going to open with a word of prayer. Father God, we just devote this time to you, Lord, this time that we get to just praise your name. This time that we've set apart at the beginning of the week to set our eyes on you and to focus on you above everything else. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your graciousness. We thank you for your faithfulness and your never-ending love for us. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 
of you are thankful this morning for a savior that paid it all for you, whose blood speaks a better word over your life, that you're a new creation in Christ. We just celebrated it last week, New Life Sunday, that you're completely brand new because he is still speaking over your life. Let's just continue to lift his name and worship him this morning.
as I was preparing for this Sunday, I was just completely overcome by the idea of how faithful our God is and how he is a God of covenant and a God of promise. And every single promise in his scripture, you know, I wanted to read this. It's from 1 Corinthians. And it says, oh, excuse me, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You know, it sticks out to me. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Even if he made the promise to you 10 years ago, no matter how many promises he has made, you can look at every promise in scripture, and it says they are yes in Christ. It is up to us to say, amen. I agree. I am in agreement with you, Father. So as we sing this song, just remind your heart of all the promises God has made to you and that they are still yes in Christ. And just acknowledge and agree with God today that they are amen.
song in mind, we're going to do something significant together. We're going to take communion, and in the chairs in front of you there, you'll see uh, communion cups. Um, if you don't have one, just go ahead and raise your hand, and the ushers will pass that out to you. We also recognize we have some people watching on Facebook as well. I'd encourage you, grab a loaf of bread and some juice and, and take communion with us. You know, as we were singing that song this morning, and as I knew that was on the set list for today, I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes when we sing a song like that and say how good his promises are, yes, he always fulfills his promises, but how many know when you're going through a storm, that's hard. Can I get an amen? amen. Yes. And I remember a moment just sitting here in my office when that song came on and my wife was in the middle of chemo and radiation and that song comes on and says, I will rest in your promises. And yeah, that sounds good on the outside, right? But practically... That's hard. That's hard. And, and I think back to the time when even the disciples felt that way so many times in Scripture. I love that, that Scripture is so open and honest. Okay? But they were in the middle of the lake. There's a massive storm. They think they're going to die. And all of a sudden they see Jesus walking out on the water looking like a ghost. Okay? Talk about scary. Jesus comes up tells him not to be afraid. He calms the storm and he gets in the boat. And I want you guys to see the scripture in Mark chapter six, because as he gets in the boat, it's an incredible moment that he climbs in and it says they were completely amazed. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been pretty amazed at this moment too, seeing somebody walk on water, get in the boat with us. But that's why the next verse almost doesn't make sense. I want to show it to you. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. It's like, uh, Jesus, that was the previous miracle. <laughs> you know, like that was that miracle. We're, we're talking about now he's, he's literally calming a storm and the waves and all these crazy things are happening. And 
What's significant about this is they are literally sitting next to 12 basketfuls of loaves, of leftovers from a little boy's lunch. And sometimes when we're in the middle of the storm, we start to get our eyes off of Jesus and off of the things that we know that he can do, off of the promises that he has. And and he goes back to this moment of feeding the 5,000. And it's in all four gospels that this is accounted for. And in John chapter 6, these people come back and they want another free meal. They come back and they want some more food. Come on, Jesus, do that thing you do, that miracle stuff. Jesus is like, you don't get it. Just coming to me, I'm sufficient for today. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Just like I'm the fulfillment of the Old Testament, of the manna dropping in the wilderness, and I'm the fulfillment of the loaves. You're not understanding. Your hearts are still hard. And maybe, maybe there are some hearts that are hard here around us today. And he told him this situation. He says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can't partake in eternal life. And uh, that was a hard teaching. People are like, what? Eating flesh, drinking blood? What is this? And then it says, all these disciples turned and walked away from Jesus. How sad is that? Jesus just did a miracle, multiple miracles in a row. And Jesus says one difficult thing, and they walk away. Church, we can't do that. Can I get an amen? Just because Jesus says something difficult does not mean it's not true. And that's why in this moment, when we take communion, we're recognizing that this this bread, this wafer, is an emblem. It's signifying, symbolizing the Lord's death on the cross. His body being broken for you. And I don't know what storm you're in or what situation that you have going on. And maybe you're just like I felt like I was angry at God when I heard that song come on. I'll be honest. Really, God? This song comes on? But I like to call it like a heavenly transaction. Like there was just this moment. Nothing else changed on the outside. Nothing externally had shifted. But when I walked out of my office, there was like a weight that had been lifted off. And I felt lighter, and I'm heavy. I'm just kidding. Making sure you're paying attention. But let's open up the top portion of this. And I want you just to get in your mind right now, whatever that situation may be, and maybe it's multiple situations. And we're going to break this bread together. And let's allow whatever that situation is, we're putting our faith in what Jesus can do, not what you can do, what he can do. (laughs) And maybe you're like, I I don't know. It's a pretty crazy storm. Well, I can promise you that God's faithfulness is right next to you. Maybe it's a person who's sitting right next to you. God is doing something incredible. We just need to perceive it. So, Father God, right now, as we break this bread together, we recognize your death on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, that your body was broken to remove our sins that you took our place on that cross. And so right now, God, as we break this bread, we ask God that you would do something significant in our lives, that today you are enough for us. Your grace is sufficient for today. Let's partake this bread together. We'll try to open up this cup of juice, which it is juice for the record. My son thought it was blood on Easter Sunday. This is just juice. When he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. We're not talking about cannibalism here in the church. But what's significant about this is we're remembering his death on the cross and the blood that he shared, shed for us. And I also want to remind you that the blood that he shared is enough. It's enough. That With this cup, we're remembering that his blood can heal today. Heal. I don't know if it's relationships. Maybe it's physical healing in your body. His blood is enough. The blood that he shed for you. So God, we just thank you, Lord, that as we take this juice, that we're remembering the blood that you shed on the cross for us. We're reminded, God, how you shed it for our spiritual bodies. But I also pray, Lord, that you'd do a physical work in us as well, that you would bring healing 
and wholeness, God, to somebody whose leg has been bothering them today. I pray right now as they drink this juice and remember your atoning sacrifice that there would be healing in Jesus' name for a relationship situation right now for somebody, God. As they drink this juice, they are going to be reminded of your power over all relationships. And so today, God, we take it in memory of what you've done for us. Let's take it together. And once you're done with the juice, you can go ahead and just put that right back in the back of the seat there. And I'd ask if you just stay standing here for a minute. We're going to go back in to this, to this song. We're going to talk about resting in God's promises. And I just want to encourage you that as, as we do this here in this moment, maybe there was something like I was sit, sitting in that situation and saying, God, this, this song sounds great, but is this real? I'd encourage you to just lean in and trust in God's faithfulness. Rest in his promises as we sing this out. that are being fulfilled even in this moment. We thank you that you are going before us. God, that you already know the beginning from the end. You're the Alpha and the Omega. Right now, we claim healing for cancer in Jesus' name. God, we pray, pray healing for multiple sclerosis in Jesus' name. God, we thank you that even now you are moving in our midst. God, we just praise you. We praise you for your promises and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's put a hand clap together for the Lord. And then turn and say hello to somebody here this morning and find your seat. Hey everyone, I'm Val and I want to welcome you to Wrightsville Assembly of God. In just a few minutes, you'll have an opportunity to give in our tithe and offering. You'll see ways to give on the screen in just a moment. And as you get ready to give, check out these announcements. We are so glad that you've joined us for church today. If this is your first time with us, we would love to get to know you better. Would you do us a favor and fill out our Connect card? You can grab a Connect card from the backs of the seats or go to wrightsvillechurch.com connect and fill out the online form. After service, you can take the Connect card or confirmation from your phone to the info center and pick up a guest gift. Doing this gives us the chance to say hi to you this week and help you get plugged in at the church. Guys, today is the last day to sign up for the Pendel Potomac Men's Conference. This Friday and Saturday, guys from across the Pendel and Potomac districts will gather together for worship and messages from powerful speakers. Guys will meet at the church to leave at 5.30 p.m. on Friday and 7.15 a.m. on Saturday. You can sign up and pay at the Info Center. And with everyone attending the men's conference, we will not have a men's breakfast this month. We want to invite everyone to join us on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. for our midweek prayer gathering. 
During these services, we take time to enter into God's presence through worship and prayer. God is moving powerfully each week as we pursue His presence together. And during these services, our Kids Club is available for kids in kindergarten through sixth grade. We want to invite you to come and be a part of what God is doing on Wednesdays. We are so excited to host our annual Community Fall Fest on Sunday, October 31st. From 6 p.m. to 8.30, we will have free food, games, inflatables, and more. If you'd like to volunteer at the event, or if you'd like to make individually wrapped desserts for our food tables, you can sign up at the Info Center today. We'll have a Fall Fest volunteer meeting on Wednesday, October 27th at 7 p.m. to go over important information and pray over the event. And one way that everyone can help us get ready for Fall Fest is by donating bags of individually wrapped candy. You can drop off bags of candy at the Info Center. That's it for this week. As the ushers receive the offering, we want to say thank you for your generosity and support of what God is doing here at Wrightsville Assembly of God. We have a lot more going on at the church than what we were able to cover today. So to stay up to date with what's happening, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, check out our website, and grab one of our October bulletins at the Info Center. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for church. We hope you have a great day. Well, good morning, church. Great to see you in the house of God today. I guess I can officially say good afternoon. It's 12.04. Glad you're with us. Hey, let me just tell you before we jump right into the message here, uh, I want to just reiterate something you just heard in the announcements. Uh, that's our Wednesday night prayer gathering. I just want to let you know because a lot of times we hear the announcements and I know, I know you're paying attention with rapt attention to everything that's happening in the church, but sometimes you can just miss it. And I want you to know if you haven't been a part of our Wednesday night, you have missed it. The most exciting hour in this church has been happening on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. I'm telling you, God is moving powerfully in those gatherings. And so I just want to encourage you to join us and be a part of it. In fact, someone snapped a photo uh, this last Wednesday night. We had everybody in a circle. We kind of did worship in the round and had about 40 people here in the room. And I think we have a picture of that there. And man, I'm telling you, it was just powerful hearing everyone collectively worshiping together, praying for the sick. Uh, speaking uh, prophetically into each other's life. I, if you're looking for the deep end of the pool, it's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I want to encourage you, just come and jump in and, uh, and join in with us and what God's doing there. Well, if you have your Bible, open it with me to the book of Romans. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 6. We're going to camp out there for a little while. I'll catch up with you there in just a moment, but I want to jump right into this message with a provocative question. And the question is, what comes to mind when you think of the word saint? Now, most of us, probably, we, we picture the, the images in the stained glass windows of churches. Or maybe it's those colorful pictures in the coffee table family Bible. You know, with all the, the men and women with halos around their head. Or, or maybe, depending on your upbringing, when you think of saints, you think of Catholicism and some of the, uh, the men and women who have been beatified in the church and, uh, and they have statues to them and even altars to them in Catholic churches. Maybe when I say saints, you think of somebody whose virtue kind of transcends humanity, like Mother Teresa, and you think of a, a noble person. Or maybe, maybe it's, it's after 12 and it's Sunday and it's October and you just think of football. <laughs> like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe you're in that camp. Or maybe you picture the, 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 the sweet little old church lady from the church you grew up in as a kid. You know, she always came in, she had a really large Bible and, you know, her hair was maybe up in a tight bun and you just looked at her and you thought, well, she's a saint. She's, she's one of the saints. Maybe even saying that, you're realizing like, you know, it's been a few years since you switched over to a large print Bible yourself and, and your hair's a little grayer than it used to and you are that church lady. <laughs> and you don't feel quite as saintly about yourself as you did about her. See, here, here's what I believe is probably true. Regardless of what you think of when I say the word saint, probably not many of us think about ourselves, right? 
I mean, if I said, are you a Christian, how many of you would just, yeah, that's me. We can buy in on that word, Christianity. That word makes sense to us. But when I say, are you a saint, I don't know, it's almost like the bar's a little higher. Like, well, I don't, I don't know about sainthood. I mean, I wouldn't go that far, preacher. But the reality is, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, the Bible says you are a saint. Doesn't that just make you feel better about yourself already? You're a saint. So I want to call you today up to sainthood, not, not in the Catholic sense of, the, uh, of what they would call a saint. I'm not inviting you to you know, have a, a manifested, authenticated miracle in your life and as a requirement, but a biblical requirement of sainthood is simply this, that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and with the Father through the Son. Here's the reality, and this is why I want to speak to this. I feel like the, the word Christian has kind of lost its luster in our culture. It just doesn't really mean what it used to mean. In fact, I, I read a statement recently from Addison Bevere that just so resonated with this thought. He said, as Westerners, we're more or less all cultural Christians, especially in the conservative pockets of society. But the collective identity of Christian has been homogenized and turned into a nightmare of unrecognizable gruel, like the stuff lunch ladies plop on the plates of terrified children. The food is certainly inclusive, but it lacks any form of definition because it's everything. Thousands of leftovers combined, and yet it's nothing. Sadly, he writes, the term Christian suffers the same fate. No offense to lunch ladies, but how many of you would say that's true? Yeah. Like that's, you know, you can, a, a Christian can mean everything and it can mean nothing all at the same time. And yet it's a word that the Bible in the New Testament uses three different times to describe the church. Three times the Bible says we are Christians. What's even more fascinating than that is over 60 times, the Bible calls us saints. And so I'm not introducing some new theological construct. Uh, we're not, we're not going to start praying to each other. But I want you to know, according to the word of God, you and I are the saints of God. And, and so I, I want to invite you to lean into what that actually means. The word in the Greek is hagios. And the Apostle Paul began six of his letters by addressing the church with that word as saints. Let me show you a couple of them. Romans chapter 1 verse 7. He said, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth. With all the saints who are in all of Achaia. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 2, he writes, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the good news about all that. All of these letters that Paul wrote, he wrote to living people. You don't have to be dead to be a saint. That's good to just get that out of the way today. No, in fact, the people of God, the saints of God, are very much in touch with their own humanity. Very much alive in this present world. You don't have to be dead to be a saint, but sainthood does begin with death. Not physical death, but spiritual death. So you, you need to know a couple things today. Number one, if you're saved, you're a saint. Last weekend, we celebrated this, this process in water baptism. Many people stepped into the, into the baptistry last week, and the scripture that we often anchor that moment of celebration to is found in Romans chapter 6. So we're going to look at several verses, but I want to start right here in verse 3 where he talks about water baptism. And Paul writes, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his Death. Now, why, why would we be baptized into his death? Well, it's simply this. We believe, according to the word of God, the wages of sin, the penalty for sin, is 
death. Jesus paid our penalty through his death. Essentially, he conquered death by death. How cool is that? He conquered death by death. And so when we get baptized in water, we're acknowledging this is not just something that we just say, oh, Jesus did this for the world. No, he did it for me. It was my sin, my penalty. And so I step into the waters and I go under the water. I take my sin and those things that deserve death and they're buried with Jesus. Here's the next verse, how Paul describes it. He says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. So we recognize when we go under the water, we're dying with Christ. Our old life, that old sinful man in us is dead. But how many of you are thankful when you got baptized, the preacher brought you back up again? Amen. We didn't just die to the old self. Paul says we have new life and we're raised in that new life. The life that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of us. And, and by the way, that work is an immediate work. It, it's a complete work. I, I love the way Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He said, therefore, if anyone, if any man, if any woman be in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. In other words, in a moment, you became a saint. Maybe it didn't feel quite like that, but it's true. And if you've been saved, you're a saint. And so maybe we ought to lean in a little bit more to what it actually means to be saved. I want to look here in Romans 6 for a few more moments because Paul just begins to unpack this for a group of Christians who he's never met before in person, but they believed in Jesus. They were persecuted and spread out. Now they're in Rome. Paul longs to meet with them. So he begins to write about them, about this great salvation that we have. Pick it up with me in verse 11, Romans 6. He says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Somebody should just claim that today. Count yourself dead to sin. Now, I don't know about you and your personal uh, walk with the Lord, but sin doesn't always feel dead in my life. In fact, there's some days it's very much alive. But he said, count yourself dead dead to sin. In other words, you know, when we're taking role, uh, th this is where I fall. Th sin uh, is dead to me. I'm dead to sin. And then he says in verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. We're going to struggle with it, but don't let it lead. Don't let it be Lord. Don't let it reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. I love that Paul doubles down on this point. He starts out saying, offer, offer yourselves to God as though you've been brought from death to life. And it's almost like he knows our, our tendency to want to withhold and to not go all in. Because then he, he doubles down on it and he says, offer every part. Like, yeah, the part you just excluded when you said, Jesus, I give you everything. Yeah, that part that you lay on the altar at the end of service. And then when the service is dismissed, you just kind of take it. And it's like, I'm just going to come. I'm, I'm not quite done dealing with that yet. I'm not done playing with that. I'm, I, I'll give you all of, all of me, Jesus. It's not all of my habits. I give you all of me, Jesus, just not all of my guilty pleasures. Not, I, I don't give you everything, not, not the bank account. I mean, I'll give you everything, Jesus, but you know what I'm saying. So Paul says, rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Offer every part to God. Then verse 14, he says, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is what's so amazing about grace. He says, sin is not your master anymore. It used to be. You used to be driven by it, but you're not under the law. You're under grace. Can I tell you, church, this is a work of the Spirit. 
This is the supernatural side of our redemption and the reality that they had the law before Jesus came and died for sin. And the truth is this, if you could have kept the law, that would have been good enough. The Bible says the law is perfect, reviving the soul. So if you could have just kept all the rules, that would have been fine. Jesus wouldn't have had to die. But the law came and the law stood as a mirror. The law became a mirror to reflect to us all of the rules we can't keep. That's what the law serves to do. And that, you, you experience this. Like when you're driving down Route 30 and you got the radio blaring and you're just jamming out, you're having a good time. And then all of a sudden you see a police car and like instinctively you take your foot off the accelerator. You know, you even turn the music down like that was a crime. You're like, oh. You know, just like you just straighten up. All, and why? Because you were just kind of doing your own thing. And then all of a sudden you were reminded of the law. And, and something put you in check. That's, that's what the law does for us. It checks us. It reminds us that you're out there. You're a sinner on the road. That's what you are. You're a sinner on the road. That's why you feel guilty. That's why you slow down, even if you weren't speeding. We're all sinners. And when we come to the word of God, it reminds us of that. But here he says, listen, sin is not your master. You're not coming under the law. You're coming under grace. We're coming under grace. So in other words, it's not all the rules that compel us to live like saints. It's the grace of God that frees us. And Paul even asks a question. It's a rhetorical question. He says, well, if we're under grace and not under the law, should we just keep on sinning? Like, does the, does the law even matter? And he says, of course, no way. No, we don't keep on sinning. And he explains that you, when you come to Christ, you, you don't just say, Jesus, I give you my heart. You give Jesus your life. It's not just verbiage that we say. It's not just some formulaic prayer that we pray or, or, or some thing that we do on the weekend. You give Jesus your whole life, and when you give Jesus your life, he changes your lifestyle. That's how this works. And Paul says, of course we're, we live differently. Of course we do. But here's the key. Look in verse 17 with me. Romans six seventeen. he says, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. I love that. Because see, a lot of people, they used to be slaves to sin, but now they've come to God from their head. And it's not really working so well. Because we, we still are, are coming according to the law, not according to grace. But he says to them, he says, you, you used to be a slave to sin, but now you've come to obey from the heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. When you receive new life in Christ, he begins to change you from the inside. You don't, you don't get up from the altar with, with just a, a list of you know, New Testament uh, law of all these things I got to do now. No, God begins to change your heart. He begins to change your passions, your inclinations, your desires, your emotions. The fruit of the Spirit begins to manifest in your life in love, joy, peace, patience. And, and all of these things begin to shift, not because of outward action, but because of the inward motivation of your heart and your life. He said, you obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that is now claimed your allegiance. And then he says in the next verse, you've been set free from sin. And you've become slaves to righteousness. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like freedom. I've been set free and now I'm a slave. Well, that's right. If you're saved, you're a saint. But if you're a saint, you're a slave. That's what he said. I've been set free from sin and now I've become enslaved to righteousness. In other words, sin used to pull me in a direction, always downward, always away from God's will, always in the direction that, that was not God's best for my life. But because I put faith in the finished work of Jesus, because I was buried in that sin and raised to new life, I have a new taskmaster. Now the righteousness of Christ is pulling me in a different direction. Now it doesn't mean I don't fight him the way I used to fight with sin. There, there's still an internal struggle, but, but I have a taskmaster. And it's the righteousness of Christ in me that compels me in the direction that he wants me to go. He calls us to righteousness. That's what Jesus said was the priority of the kingdom. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. 
Jesus didn't come to improve your life. Jesus came to give you a new life. He came to make us new. And so, if you're saved, you're a saint. But you also need to know that if you're a saint, you're set apart. There's something special that God has in mind for you. That word for saint, hagios, it is also used to describe things that are most holy. In, in other words, there were things in, in the temple and in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the instruments, the utensils that the priests would use. They had a special purpose they were consecrated for. They were set apart. They were sanctified. They could only be used for certain things. And, and the Bible says if you're a saint of God, that's who you are. You're set apart for a special purpose, for a special assignment. How, how does that even, what does that look like for us? I want to go to a verse that I shared last Sunday in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. It says this, For by one sacrifice he, Jesus, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Talked about it last week, the reality that positionally, he has made you perfect. Positionally, you're holy. But practically, you're not quite there yet. Practically, you're still being made holy. Do you understand the difference? He's saying, in, in the eyes of God, when you give your life to Christ, in that moment you came up out of the waters of baptism, the Spirit of Christ is alive on the inside of you, you're a new creation, you're a saint. You're a saint. You can't ever get more saved than saved, okay? So it's not like we got like level one salvation. I think some people treat, you know, the kingdom of God like those, those people at the little carts at Sam's. You know, like you go by and get a free sample. Like you just get a little bit saved. But you got to like, you got to spend some money if you want the real deal. Like, no, this is not a free sample salvation. Like if you're saved, you're saved. God calls you saints, sons and daughters of the most high God. But we're not perfected yet. So he says, you're perfect positionally, but practically you're being made holy. And so let's put it all together. As Romans 6 says, because you come to God out of your heart, not out of your head. Because you're a slave to righteousness and not to bondage and fear. Because your slavery is, is not a spirit of bondage, but it's one of sonship to God then that means saints of God. We are committed to closing the gap between where we stand positionally with God and where we live practically. That's what we're here to do. We're here to close the gap so that more and more, in ever-increasing glory, we are reflection of the image of God. That's the goal. That from the moment I got saved, God saw me as perfect, and now I'm going to spend the rest of my life being perfected. We're committed to closing the gap. I, I love the way that the Tyndale Bible Dictionary defines saints. Here's one of the definitions. It says, saints are people of the coming age. In other words, a saint is someone who brings a future reality into the present. That's what saints do. We bring a future reality into the present. We don't walk around with our head in the clouds, uh, out of touch with the issues of our world are detached from the struggles of life. In fact, it's the opposite. Saints are very aware of their own humanity. It's not a super spirituality. It's the fact that we've seen what humanity can look like in the image of Jesus. So our very human perception is transfixed by the image of Christ. We're set apart for a purpose. And we know it. See, the saints are the citizens of God's kingdom. And so the will of a king is exercised in the lives of the citizens in the kingdom. So when Jesus said, here's how you pray. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. That's how Jesus said to pray. Who do you think's answering that prayer? Like, how do you think God's will is being exercised in the earth? It's in the conduct, in the life of the citizens of the king. His kingdom is coming and his will is being done because we're walking in obedience to his plan and purpose for our lives. We're set apart for it. Ephesians 2.10 says it like this, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's, that's who we're called to be. That's what we're called to do. Good works. That's why when Paul was writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, he addressed them like this. He said, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified. In other words, that's, that's a finished work. That's perfect. Positional holiness. They are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. In other words, you are set apart, but you're called to be set apart. You are saints, now act like it. You are sanctified, now get sanctified. This is his plan, or can we say sanctified? <laughs> this is his plan for our lives aligning with who he says we already are. Soren Kierkegaard said this, God creates out of nothing. But he does what is still more wonderful. He makes saints out of sinners. Isn't that what God did in your life? It's, it's like when, you're, when your kids were little and they took their first steps. You remember that? Now, I, I, there's a lot of significant moments in my kids' lives that I didn't capture on film uh, or, or digital video, but when they got close to walking, we always had the camcorder within arm's reach. Like, we wanted to make sure we caught this moment. And, and we, we were so excited when they took those first steps. You remember what it was like? I mean, it wasn't pretty. You know, it was just like, they were falling forward, actually, is what was happening. You know? They looked like a drunk trying to pass a sobriety test on the side of the highway. It was like, they're doing that thing. But we were so excited. We were so thrilled in what they were doing. And the reality is... As, as fumbling as it was, our joy was not in their degree of accomplishment. Our joy was in the direction. Our joy was in the step. Like they didn't have to run very far. They didn't have to stay up very long. But can I tell you it's no different with your Heavenly Father? He is more concerned with the trajectory of your life than He is with the perfection of it. He, he wants to know that you're stepping in the right direction. That your life is marked with a direction. That the Spirit of God lives in you. And from the heart, you are living out those truths that you claim. Not according to the law, but according to grace. Christians aren't sinless. But we do sin less. Because we understand that God is calling us to something that He already calls us. Romans 6 and verse 6 says it like this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So listen, no, nobody's polishing their halo this morning. I understand that. But we should be striving towards Christ's likeness not, not, because, not because we're trying harder, not because we think we can achieve it on our own, but because our, our, our minds are set on the Spirit of God. And we've chosen, I'm going to take steps today. I'm going to take steps today to submit to the Spirit of God that's in us. I, I want to go to one more place in the book of Romans chapter 8. And as the worship team comes, I just want you to just let the words of the Apostle Paul resonate in your heart today. As he describes... For the church, what it looks like to live a spirit-filled life. Because we've all felt the tension. We've all felt the tension of the gap that exists between how we live practically and who God says we are. That's why we shudder at the idea of being called a saint. Ooh, I don't know. That, does, that doesn't sound like me this weekend. Ask me on Easter Sunday. Don't ask me today. Don't ask me in October. But Paul is speaking to the church about the reality, the miracle that happens when we surrender everything to Jesus. And look, look at it with me in Romans 8 verse 5. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. 
The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And I know some of us would have to say amen to that. Like, man, I've tried. I tried with the heart of flesh. I, tr- I tried to like, you know, just keep up the appearance of godliness. I tried to just do the right thing and at least look like I was trying. And you know what I found out? I can't. I can't. The heart of flesh, he said, cannot do it. Verse 8, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. That sounds condemning, but honestly, it's liberating. It's liberating for the person that thinks, if I just try harder, if I try harder, Paul says, just stop. It's not possible. You know how many generations of people tried before you came? It's not possible. And Can I just pause here and say, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. If you've grown complacent in your journey and you've stopped moving forward, sooner or later you will find yourself in the company of the Pharisees, feeding off of your own righteousness. And so Paul just says, just, just know this, you can't do it. You can't do it in the realm of the flesh. Verse 9, he goes a little farther and he says, you, however... Saints, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. I I love that Paul is saying, look, the battle with sin didn't end when you got saved. In fact, your body is always going to be subject to death, the wages of sin, the penalty of sin. I've done quite a few funerals over the last year to remind me that we're still subject to death. But because of the Spirit, he says, it gives us life. Verse 11 If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This is supernatural. And and this is what, what I want you to see finally. Verse 12. He says, therefore. In other words, because of that, because of what the spirit of Christ is doing in your life, therefore, brothers and sisters, We have no obligation to the sinful nature. Or as this translation says, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. You know, the devil would love to give you plenty of excuses that says, just look around. Everybody's doing it. Everybody sins. Everybody compromises. Everybody lives by a lower standard. It's 2021. But can I tell you what the Bible says? You have no obligation to sin. No obligation to sin. Why? Because the Spirit of Jesus lives in you. As the late Adrian Rogers used to say, there's two types of people in the world. There's the saints and the ain'ts. Which one are you? The saints or the ain'ts? Paul said, it's not of works, lest any of us should boast. It's the gift of God. That's what I'm declaring to you today. I want to invite you to stand with me all over this room. As we get ready to close this service, I want to just invite you into a moment of prayer right now. Into a moment of prayer. Would you ask the Holy Spirit to turn the searchlight on your own heart and on your own life? Ask Him to reveal, is there any area of my life that I haven't I haven't given to you completely because when he told us to come he said come with your whole heart and be set apart if there's any area of your life that you say yeah Jesus I give you everything but but you haven't given him that let this be that moment that you really trust Jesus with every area of your life with every area of your life and maybe there's, maybe there's someone here today, you just feel like you, you haven't 
you haven't been set apart completely to the work of God. Like you love the Lord and I mean, you're here. He has his place in your life. But you haven't allowed yourself to be set apart, fully committed to his plan, his purpose, his agenda for your heart and for your life. Can we just take a moment to surrender ourselves to the Lord right now? Father, in this place, I pray that the Spirit of the living God, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, would dwell in us. God, that you would quicken us, quicken our minds, quicken our bodies, quicken our emotions. God, today, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, would you begin to close the gap between who you say we are as the saints of God and and how we look and live day in and day out. God, we come to you today to ask you to perfect your work in us. Jesus, we surrender. We surrender ourselves fully and wholly to you. God, make us holy. Let us be a pure reflection, Jesus, of who you are. Not not a diluted, watered down, homogenized version of a, a cultural Christianity, but a bride, spotless and radiant, and looking and longing for the appearing of her bridegroom. Jesus, make your church holy. By your grace, call us upward. May we be slaves of righteousness. May we sense your spirit calling us, even as deep calls out to deep. Call us today. Come on, if you're just ready in your heart and your mind to just embrace that spirit that wants to lead you and guide you and transform you into the image of Jesus in the earth today. Let's just take another few moments. I'm going to ask the worship team to sing these words over us. As we just declare this today, it is true of you. It's true of me. God's word is speaking over our identity today. Come on, if you believe that, would you declare it today? Come on, His blood speaks a better word over you. He's covering your sins. He's forgiving your past. He's rewriting your story. Come on, believe it today. It's your truth today. Making all things right. Oh, it's making all things Lord, right. refine us today. Come on, declare it again. It's rewriting my history. Oh, it covers me with destiny. Come on, let His Word do the work in your heart and your life. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Let his word speak over you. Cancel every curse in Jesus' name. You are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Come on, hear him. He's calling out your identity today. Set us free, Jesus. It's breaking every chain. Wash us in your crimson flow. It's making all things right. Hallelujah. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Come on, say that again. It's calling out. It's a better word. It's calling out my name. Oh, and it's calling out my name. You call the sons and daughters, Jesus. It's breaking every chain. Come on, believe that. Believe that today. It's making all things right. The blood of Christ speaks a better word. It speaks a better word.
God, I thank you that right now you're speaking over your sons and daughters. Every lie from the enemy is canceled in Jesus' name. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. We are free in Jesus, Lord. Not because of our, our ability to align our lives with a list of standards and laws, but because the kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance because your grace is greater than our sin. God, I thank you that, that your grace is extended to us today. That not only do you call us into salvation, but you call us up to sainthood. You call us to be a reflection of Jesus in the earth today. Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done in and through our lives. In the earth, just like it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen. If you're thankful for his word, would you give him praise with me today? Come on, thank him for the work he's doing in your life. He's making all things right. He's making all things right. And if it ain't right, he's not finished. Amen? If it ain't right yet, he's not finished. I pray God bless you today. Have a wonderful Sunday. I hope you'll join us Wednesday night. And listen, if you'd like somebody to pray with you even before you leave, these altars are going to be open for the next few moments. I want to just invite you. Just step out from where you are. You can come now even as we dismiss this service. God bless you.